October 27, 2017, conversation between artist, photographer, uh, docent, Peter Schreier, and uh, curator, Francesca Bacci. You brought uh, three different bodies of work for our exhibition, and I would like for you to um, introduce me to each one separately, letting me know what you think it's important to know about each one considered as a series. The decision to, to bring the three bodies of work was based on the fact that I had never shown in the Tampa area, so that, that the community here will see my work for the very first time. So the first body of work represents a selection of work from different projects that I've done over the last two decades that all deal with Florida communities and they are a combination of social landscapes and environmental portraits. So in each one there is a story about the place, about the person. Sometimes uh, the person is visible in the photograph but even in the images where there are no people visible it's all about the people and what they have left behind or what they have created. And a lot of times I'm interested in sort of these layers of stories, the things that are more obviously visible, like a building, a highway, a railroad track. And But I'm also interested in the layers that are below that are maybe hidden, that you can maybe think about or dream about when you, when you study the photograph. But then with the oral histories that I connect, collect through interviews or research, I introduce other aspects of those layers of the story that would not necessarily uh, be visible, you know, in, in, the in the photograph. And then in some of the images, of course, there's people in there, and these are highly, they're highly posed photographs in, in environments that are very familiar to the person, so either a place or where they've worked for a long time, or where they've lived for a long time, or a place that they're very close to in, in, their, in their community. So a lot of times, uh, there is lengthy conversations and some meetings that that lead up to actually making making the pho the photograph, which makes the people very comfortable in your presence. Yes. It seems to me when I look at these photos, you say highly posed in a way because they're prepared, but they're more prepared perhaps in the psychological interaction aspect yes. than they're in, the, in the They're very comfortable at that prop, point. They're right? very they're very very comfortable at 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 that at that point. And they're also in a comfortable, you know, comfortable in envir environment. And the, um, you know, they're all about Florida, and they're all about the changes in Florida, and it's all about the role that these environments have played in people's lives and communities' lives, uh, the memory, you know, that that's there, sort of hidden in them, and uh, also they're they're using photography as a way of setting a testament and a record because. Uh, some of the places are no longer there, others have noticeably changed, you know, and, uh, and others, interestingly enough, still have, have survived, you know. So I also uh, sometimes go back to some of the places and I also take my students there and so, and so forth. And then the, uh, uh, the other body of work is uh, from an entirely different place. It's from my hometown, Pietelen in Switzerland, which is a little town. Uh, uh, they just uh, passed their 4,000 mark in, in population re re recently. And when I grew up there, you know, 40 plus years ago, it was 3,500. So it's not really <laughs> grown a lot, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's not one of these picturesque Swiss towns, you know, like in the Alps or on a lake or something like that. It's an industrial town. It's a railroad town. Uh, my parents had a small business there. I don't have family that lived there anymore. But... Uh, I do go back frequently, but I've never, I've not really done any photography there in a really, really long time. I have in other parts of Switzerland, but not in the little town where, where I grew up. But it's where my roots are. It's where I took my first photo class in school. I did build my first dark room in my parents' house, you know, that, that I inherited from, from an older sister who was an artist also. And uh, so it's something that I wanted to do for a while, and I did it uh, in 2013. Uh, I went back and uh, they really spent two weeks every day photograph, photographing there. And um, it was a wonderful experience because 
and I really built my career as a photographer, as a documentary in America. So it was all about American culture and American communities. And it's given me this incredible opportunity to see into the lives and cultures and communities of people that that many people who grew up in America never have an opportunity, you know, to do. Uh, sometimes I, th I thought maybe I had a slight advantage because I was from another country, you know. I so, understand that. Yeah, so I had access to to communities of migrant workers and historical African American communities and so forth that uh, uh, many people who were born in America really know nothing about or, or have never really been part of. So I've learned so much about American history and culture, it, its beauty and its disparities and, and, and so forth. So going back to Switzerland, to my own town that was familiar territory, you know, as a kind of as an American photographer now with American sensibilities, with Swiss roots, you know, because I've been here for so long. So it was very interesting to go back and, and to photograph and, and find what had changed and what had not what had not changed, you know, and also learning things about places that I've known all my life, but I didn't really know that much about them. You know, when you grow up somewhere, you, you take like, them like, for granted. You take them for granted. Like, you know, when you grow up in the mountains, you take them for granted. Now I miss the mountains, you know, and, and like to go there. So, uh, one so, thing that I wanted to ask you, though, about that precise experience is... Um, how is it different to photograph something that you actually do remember that it's your memories? Do you look for a visual match to what you remember? Do this landscape, have they been rewriting your old memories? There must be a tension there between the, the city in your head and the city how you see it when you as an adult and, and an artist decide to photograph it. Very much, very much so. Going back, you know, as a middle-aged artist, uh, but, but the, the, the thing that's so incredible, what, what was so evident to me, there, there's a lot of experiences. Uh, the experience of photographing in a place that has changed so little over the decades. You know, where I came to Central Florida more than 30 years ago to a place that would see dramatic, incredible changes that I got to witness, that I got to be part of, and I also got to photograph. Going back, you know, to Switzerland, yes, I would see some of the factory buildings, there were thriving factories where parents of my friends would work when I was in school and now they're either empty or you know they have little businesses in there or their their warehouses and, 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 and things like that. So you know seeing so these kind of changes but compared to America they are such subtle changes. They're such small changes. The other thing was also a personal experience is that just the power of memory, the, the blessing of memory. Uh, to be able to go back because there are people who cannot go back. You know, there are people from countries uh, that I've met, immigrants that cannot go back because their country is war torn, you know. And also the personal experience in my own family. Uh, my, my mother had just recently, before that experience, uh, died of, of a very ripe age. She was in her 90s. But she had suffered from severe memory loss the last few years of her life, and, and that was so painful to watch, you know. And for me to go back and just be full of memories, on every rock, every building, every house, wow, I used to walk by on my way to school here, you know, and 50 years later, it's still here, you know. So it was a, Amazing. Yeah, it was, a, it was a really a blessing to be able to, to, uh, to have that. So what's, what kind of Switzerland are you, are you telling us with your storytelling? via images because you know people have some association like the precision the uh, chocolate the mountains uh, you seem to be telling a slightly different story yeah it, it's it's uh, it's a story of, 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 of a quiet community which many of them very much are the smaller towns with relatively little change and but also where people really take care of their places and their communities you know and it's it's a, it's a cliche about switzerland but having lived in america for so long now where so many of our communities only by force and ordinances you know and laws people will take care of them you know so much of it is just not being taken care of or mm -hmm. trashed or destroyed and going back to just an ordinary swiss town and just rediscovering just the way people keep their yards and, and, and their homes and, and, and the, the pride, you know, that, that's it. And so that was, that was very strong. And, and also the, the, uh, 
how things are not being abandoned, how they're being reappropriated. You know. Do you think that when you work on an American uh, place or, or personal story, that act of discovering their memories and some sort of appropriating them uh, through an image in a way makes you build a, a bond that wouldn't be there because you tap into that connection uh, that you can't have because you, you weren't there where those stories yes. were unfolding. Yeah. Is that a process? That's yeah. Kind of similar. Yeah, yeah. It's a very, it's a, it's it's a very beautiful process. When you know about things, you start caring. That is exactly the key. That is exactly the key. Uh, and I hope, in, in a humble way, that my photography can do that for people. You know, because a lot of the communities in America that I photograph are communities that, by the general perspective, are often thought of as either unimportant. Or you know, not contributing to the major, uh, major exactly. cultural discourse. You know, it's it's like like I hate that that term. You know, when people say, "Well, we need to go clean up that community." You know, what does that mean? Clean up a community? Does it mean uprooting people and taking everything away that has that has meaning it's to a them? Very forceful, you know? violent act. Yeah, and I've seen this in 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 communities, especially in communities of people of color in Florida, where. There's kind of like, uh, you know, now you got your equality, so now we're going to take your community and bulldoze everything, you know. And, and I've had the reaction to my work many times by, by visitors or people been writing about it, is that it is giving them uh, an opening to see a community or a place to different eyes and to see the similarities between all people or the similarities between all communities, you know. So for, and I see that with my students also, the kids. The, the teens that I sometimes work with, and that sort of connects with the, the third pro project, uh, which is called Storytellers, where the school that I work for, Creole, the School of Art, we, we have a program that I developed almost 20 years ago that's called Storytellers, where we work with a group of teens from often an underserved community, and we teach them about storytelling through photography and actually also through writing. Fantastic. And, and it's all about them photographically rediscovering their own, their own community. And often they will say things like, you know, I've seen this all my life. I never thought anything special about it. And now I do. And now I know that if it wasn't here anymore, I will be missing it. You know? That's so, fantastic. So it's a mentorship project. So I'm showing you four images that, that are mine that were done with this project just a few months ago mm -hmm. in a historic African-American community in New Smyrna Beach on Florida on the, the, uh, the west side of the railroad tracks, which was, you know, culturally and historically how a lot of East Coast Florida communities were, were, were racially divided. Fantastic. So thank you so much for your time in your interview, and we're looking forward to opening your show very soon. <laughs> thank you so Thanks. much, Francesca. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a little bit about your photographic technique. I work with film, as I have done my whole life. It's not that I don't have a digital camera. I actually deal with a lot of students who work, work in digital. But I have just really, always really loved the film process, and I've stayed with that. And uh, I went into digital for a little bit without giving up film, kind of trying to do it side by side. And I just really decided for where I am at my point in my life with uh, the time I have to devote to my artwork, that I, I like to continue working in this sort of slow and quiet process, you know, of, of film involving my dark room. I mean, it's a technique that that uh, I have perfected, you know, over, over over the years. I like that quiet time to go in there, close the door, play my jazz in the background, you know. And uh, just like the rest of us, as an arts administrator, an educator, I'm on the computer, on my iPad, and my phone all the time. So for my artwork, I just don't want to do that, I, you know, and I, I enjoy... Uh, the film, the film process, very much. I like the slowness of it. I like the idea of not uh, taking hundreds of photographs, but taking maybe a few dozen, like on a, on a project, you know. Mm -hmm. And of course, I still do a lot of editing and all of that. I uh, so but when you say you do editing, you, you're talking about what well, you do the negative, like the good old days. 
Yeah, I mean, I you know, it's not like I always just shoot one picture and that's the perfect one. I might still take several mm -hmm. different angles of the same thing, and then I make a contact print, and then I make work prints, and then I live with those work prints for a little bit of time, you know, and then I go ahead and decide, and I make the exhibition print, you know, the old-fashioned way, on fiber-based paper, or I selenium tone it to give it 100% maximum permanence, you know, so it's completely archival. And then I hand, I touch it up, you know, with spotting things for little flaws and so forth. I put it in a press to make it perfectly flat. Then I put it in an acid-free board. I mean, it's an entirely handmade process from uh, from the beginning, from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. And I work with uh, professional cameras, medium format, mostly 120 film, uh, relatively contemporary cameras, but I also like to work with vintage cameras. Mm -hmm. I, four of the photographs in the show are done with a, with a 1950s Rolleiflex. Which ones? Uh, the square ones. Okay. The square ones. And uh, when I bought that camera years ago, it was already an old camera. It's really old now, so it's almost the same. Actually, it was manufactured, I looked it up, uh, in 1956, which is the same year I was born. I wow. did not know that when I purchased it. And uh, I sort of, uh, because of my students' fascinations with the vintage cameras, mm -hmm. I sort of reconnected. I was never much of a of a, an equipment person. You know, the camera was always just kind of a tool, tool mm -hmm. for me. And the majority of the work I shoot with a medium format uh, Pentax camera, 645, which is from the late 1980s. At that time, it was a state-of-the-art camera. For a film camera, it's about as far as film cameras went. Mm -hmm. you know. And it's, it's a wonderful professional camera that has a good meter built in and everything. Where the Rolleiflex from the 50s is very bare bones. It has no light meter. It has one fixed lens. And uh, but I like that limitation. I have started working with it more over the last about a year and a half. I like the limitation, kind of more like the painter who has that canvas, and that's that's it, and that's what they can deal with, you know. And my canvas is that square image that I see looking down, reversed in the viewfinder. <laughs> well, I you know when you talk about traditional um, black and white film process, of course I have to ask you. Uh, about Ancelada method and how much control that gives to the intensities of the blacks and to the definitions in the whites and into all the intermediate grays. And I'm thinking about what's really lost with digital photography is that once you choose your medium gray, once you choose, it's a way of choosing what to really focus on to give you maximum optimal visibility, all the rest is connected in sort of a consequential proportion. Mm -hmm. While with digital camera, where you can co correct only that specific gray, or only that, that proportion shatters. Like mm -hmm. things are not in a web of relationships. And I don't know, but I think it's very visible in your work when I look at your work. I can see the full nuance of, of the grays and all the blacks and, and, and into the light. That's the idea. And exactly. I wanted to ask you if that's appealing to you, if that's something you pursue no, cautiously. It's hugely appealing to me and and to be able to to really control the entire process and, and having to depend relatively little on technology. And I know that uh, that's really fascinating to my students also, you mm -hmm. know, who are, are getting into film in larger numbers these days is to be able to do it by hand. They use terms like, oh, it's so, I, you know, I can feel the photograph, the prints, and so forth. And I like the slowness of the process, because I, I think that there's a lot to be said about, I like to live with my work for a little bit. I like to, uh, uh, different people do different, have different approaches. Some people like to do show it to a lot of people. I usually just kind of, before I show it to people, I might show it to my wife or so. But I, I like to live with it and see how, how my, how I see it, you know, how it, if it if it changes or not, you know, and I love the process to be able to really control um, the grayscale and the tonality. There's just so much beauty to be able in the dark room to literally add, mm -hmm. similar to a painter, to add layers and layers on top of the photograph where there was a washed out sky at the end. You have a really nice gray tonality or something like that. Mm -hmm. The last question I have for you. It's a question on formats, because some of your photos will naturally lend themselves to be blown up big. Mm -hmm. um, it will completely change the relationship between viewer and image, and I think some of your photographs also capture that 
um, sense of intimate relationship when you actually ho hold an object in your mm -hmm. hands because photographs were born for that. Mm -hmm. They were born for being looked at from very close distance, sort of within your personal space. That's right. Space, A lot right? of people forget that, yeah. And, and it, so there, there's that implied tactility, and, and uh, if you were to blow them up big, that, that would be lost and would create a completely different discourse. So I wanted to ask you if you've ever considered or if you've ever done to produce big photographs and how that would play with your message and your... It's a really interesting question. Somebody said to me a long time ago that photographs ideally were really made to a size to be looked at in a book you know mm -hmm. where you have it in your lap and you're you're inches away away from it and I've often felt I prefer it actually on a gallery wall with beautiful lighting or in a museum wall to be a couple feet away from it but I'll admit uh, on a couple occasions a few occasions my work has been blown up on posters you know for 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 uh, advertisements for exhibitions and it's, it's kind of nice, too. You know, I like <laughs> to see it. Uh -huh. And I've had people periodically ask me about doing, why don't you do some work larger? There, there's certain technical challenges to do that, especially mm -hmm. with, with film, where, where I would probably, I, and I, I'm hoping that I'll have the resources to do that down the road sometimes, to take a few of the images and, uh, and then have them, have them basically make scans from them mm -hmm. and then have them printed as, as digital prints very large. And or I'd like you'd to have see. to use a much bigger negative. Yeah, yeah. The no, it's not that they will not hold up. Like it, will, it will hold up. It's it will the hold sharpness up. will help. It's not the problem. It's just to handle the in a wet, yeah. dark room. Yes. Large prints is, uh, is incredibly cumbersome and also extremely expensive. You That's know. true. That's true. So, uh, I mean, you could go to like 16 by 20 in the dark room that I have but anything over that, you would need to like build special everything mm. for it to be able to yeah. to to handle it. But but I, I think I'm going to try it for maybe a handful of do it the other way and see how I feel about it. Yeah, I you know it, it was part of my idealism I think of coming coming to to America because uh, I really when I came here in my early twenties as a young photographer. I discovered the Farm Security Administration and all of these things and that work, and that's exactly the work that I've always wanted to do mm -hmm. about the common places and everyday situation mm -hmm. and people and so forth. And I had just, I mean, I know it exists in Europe too, but it impressed me so much that there was a time in this country where the federal government actually hired and employed sure. artists and how that work has had a life for decades and decades and decades mm -hmm. afterwards and how we use it as a way of going back and, and looking, you know, the roots of the country and where it came from and where some of our challenges come from and, and so forth. And I just, it was my greatest and most humble uh, desire to one day to be able to do work that, that in some humble way follows in, 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 that, in that tradition. And I just feel so fortunate and blessed that I've been able to do work like this, that I've been able to get grant support and get in a few collections and, and you know, get just for what I do. Fantastic. You know, so. That's fantastic. And I can see definitely a connection between the works we have on the walls and some of those inspirations. So thanks for being with us Thank and you. we look forward to opening <laughs> the show together.